This meeting is being recorded. Thank you, Father, for this wonderful opportunity to come together with like-minded people discussing the Word on this special day. Thank you, Father, for your insights and your wisdom that you're sharing with us today. And Father, help us to receive it and help us also to prepare for your coming. I ask all the mighty name of Yeshua Mashiach. Amen. Amen. All right, so we are in Parasha 46. Ekev. That means because it's also translated as reward and wages. Um, now, what's interesting is the word ekev, ayin kuf bet on the top left. The middle letter is the letter kuf, and kuf is normally associated with the turning of the head, repentance, or decision making. So that's a very pinnacle um, um, word and meaning that we need to. Uh, um, take note of and um, so that will be coming evident through this study all right so Torah portion chapter 7 through to chapter 11 um, it's basically Moses reflecting back on the main themes that he want to recall because this is a repeating of the Torah to the next generation and he's highlighting the most important things that the new generation should know in order to enter into the promised land so it's basically a continuation from last week but we're just going to have some different views on it so this is just a slide that i am going to reference um, it's to do with yahweh's grace and yahweh's attributes the 13 attributes of grace and these 13 attributes of grace are basically our lifelines that are available for us during this time period of traveling through the wilderness as you can see from the first three, Yahweh is emphasizing himself because he's the solution to the problem. He is our exceedingly great reward. And then we see merciful, grace, slow to anger, kindness, truth, and then yet again kindness, underlining that his motive and his love towards us. And then we see the last four is about forgiving iniquity, forgiving willful sin, forgiving error or unconditional or not unconditional unintentional sin and then clearing and cleansing the guilty it's all about forgiving and cleansing it's a process of refinement and that's what you see in the character of yahweh and the attributes of grace it's all about us engaging with him knowing that it will lead to echad which is number 13 as well which is oneness with him my father which is abi and also love of Aha, um, Ahava, uh, which all adds up to number 13 as well. So it's the love of the Father that makes us one with Him. Very, very uh, significant and fund fundamental. All right, so this Torah portion is Ekev. That means because. It's normally translated as wages or heal. Um, it could also be translated as to supplant and to circumvent if you change the vowel points. And it's normally not translated as because, because it's a very unique translation. And there's other Hebrew words that can be used instead, but Yahweh chose this word to make a connection. So we're going to make the connection with Ekev, with the serpent, with Jacob, with the concept of a heel, and with judgment. Now, if you think about the word Ekev um, in, the, in, in the concept of because, it's a consequence that will happen because of something that happened that will result in wages the wages can be good or bad the consequences of what you've done so that's that's basically um what's happening now so that's basically a um underlining principle of cause and effect when you do good you'll be blessed when you do bad you'll be cursed the because is the consequence idea, and this is what is being underlined in this Torah portion. Um, the other meaning of a kev, if you change the vowel points, is a kav, that means to supplant and circumvent. So that is a result of walking around something, finding a way around something or circumventing something and that's the supplanting aspect or character that was expressed through the character of Jacob 
And Jacob depicts the fallen man, the old nature, because he was changed into Israel, the righteous people of Elohim, which is the mature form or the transformed state of man. So he started off being a Yaakov. Now Yaakov had similar attributes to the serpent. And how we get that is where uh, the connection with Genesis 3.15, where the word Akaf is first found in scripture. Where the offspring, which is Eve's offspring, or Chava's offspring, her offspring will crush your head, which is the head of the Nachash, or the serpent, and you, the serpent, will bite her offspring's heel. And that is the, the connection to the heel. Now, if you think about the heel, the heel is the lowest part of the body. It makes connection with the ground, which is basically associated with the physical. So the heel is the lowest part of the body, of the lowest uh, thing that you can associate with the fleshliness of man. Now that connection that makes connection with the physical ground is where the serpent will come in. He won't bite you on the head because he can't reach that high. He need to get you when you're at your lowest, when your heel is hitting the ground. And that's where he comes in, when you're in your most fleshly state. And then his venom will bite you in the, in, in the, in the heel. Now the, the heel is also important because your feet are associated with your walk, your halakha. And if there's venom in your heel, it will change your walk. It will change your halakha. It will either make you more un ineffective or even stop you from walking altogether. So the, the, the halakhash knows that you need to be walking in the way, following a direction that leads through the wilderness into a doorway that leads to a gate that will enter into the Garden of Eden or the Promised Land. So if he can stop you from walking, he's, he knows that you won't reach your destination. So that's where the idea of the Nachash and his main tactic is to attack you on your lowest point of fleshiness, where the venom will change your halakha and your walk and either paralyze you or change in such a way that you will lose your way and not find the way that leads to the gate or the doorway, which is Mashiach and the entry point of the restoration back into the promised land. So that's the connection between the serpent, the venom, Jacob, the fallen man, the, the, the symbolism of the old man, old nature. And that's also connected to just judgment. And where that's connected to judgment is because the on the banner of Dan is the serpent. And the serpent is now connected to Dan. Dan means to judge or judgment. And the serpent will be judged, so the head will be crushed. And that's the symbolism of Dan. Dan is not a serpent himself. He is the serpent uh, crusher. He's the destroyer of the serpents. But he's also got the tactic of the serpent. So it's sort of a two-way thing. If you, if you look at it from an, a weak perspective or a fleshy perspective, yes, you can be ineffective. But if you are strong and you stand up against it, you will crush the serpent's head. And that's basically where... The wrestling of Jacob, of Yaakov, came into being. Where he received the hand, which is the iron that's connected to the word Akaf, which is the hand of Yahweh helping the fallen man in order to become um, the one who is uh, uh, changed to, to Yisrael. Now the word Akaf is the command of 182 that mean, means heal, catcher, supplanter, breach, Cleft. Now that word breach and cleft connects to the 13 attributes of Yahweh. Because that's the cleft where Yahweh hit Moshe. And he walked past by and he showed him his glory. And the glory is revealed through these 13 attributes of Yahweh's character and his grace. That's the solution to the problem of restoring man. Now that is depicted with Yaakov um, through the meaning of the 182. But it's also connected to the Torah which is directly connected to Moshe. So the Torah's attributes or the Torah's motive are these 13 attributes, which is all to do with cleansing, forgiveness, restoration, and then through Yahweh's grace and all that, be restored back to him. And he reveals himself in three different levels to us. So we're going to see that through this meaning as well. So that's the first place is the Nahash that's been revealed and the fleshiness of man, which is the venom of the serpent biting him in the heel. And then we also see the second place where this word Akav is used is where Yaakov, the heel catcher, <clears throat> was born. Where he held on to the heel of his brother 
um, Esau. Now Esau was known as the man of the flesh. So it seems like Yaakov wanted to become like Esau, the man of the flesh. So he held onto his heel. So that's the old tendency of the flesh, wanting to reach back into the fleshiness, wanting to become like his hairy brother who was born first because yeah, it's all about the firstborn. It's all about having all the you know uh, glory and fame and money and whatever of the firstborn, the birthright. But it's actually not about that. It's about becoming the priest of the household. So that's the actual function of the firstborn. So if you have a fleshly view on your birthright, it will be all about the money and all about that and the wealth and the status. But if you look at it from a spiritual perspective, it's all about humility, it's all about the priests, it's all about serving other people. Now eventually Yaakov got it and he was translated into Yisrael, which is basically another name for priesthood because they were the kingdom of priests who went out in the world to facilitate the function of what Yahweh wants them to do. So Yaakov is the old man, Esau is the, 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 the blueprint of the lowest form of human that you can get, which is embodying the Nachash. Yaakov is sort of grabbing to that, but Yahweh is sort of uh, getting me out of it by giving him a hand or the Yad, and then pulling him out of it, translating him into Yisrael, which is now becoming the kingdom of priests, which will now do his work. So we see the rescuing of Yahweh through the character Yaakov. Um, being pulled away from Esau and pulled away from the Nachash's um, in, 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 intervention there. What we also see is the connection with Dan, um, judgment, and Yaakov and Esau, with the kiss of Esau, where you see the bite marks there in the Hebrew on the bottom right. That kiss is basically uh, enchantment. The Nachash means enchanter, so he's doing something, but he's motive is totally the opposite his actions and his motive are, are, are polars of each other it's it's good and bad light and darkness so whenever you see the angel of light you know there's massive darkness behind it and you can't trust that um, motive or that action so in the same case we see it here with the kiss of Esau, which is another uh, con uh, uh, meaning for the great tribulation which links to judgment and judgment is also embodied now in the word of Ekev because a result of and the judgment is basically the, the separation. Because you chose this, you will go that way or you will go this way. You will separate the sheep and the goat because of what they've done. So the Ekev is basically embodying that whole judgment aspect as well that we'll see through the Great Tribulation where the character of Jacob comes back into play with the kiss of Esau, where the man of the flesh and the renewed man called Yisrael is now having conflict with one another, which is uh, basically the persecution of the, the righteous people in the, in the last days during the time of tribulation. So we see all of that coming to play through these characters. Then I just put in there the 3858, which is just a number that connects the Nachash with Mashiach, because they are total opposites of one another. And the Mashiach is the solution to the problem, which is Nachash. And then the Nachash is the one who owns the kingdom of the world because the Adam sold it to him by following and submitting to him. He basically gave it to him on a golden platter. So now Mashiach is helping with the hand, giving it to Yaakov, uh, changing his, his, his walk and also changing him into a priesthood, becoming the priest of Mashiach. He is the high priest through the 358, reversing the consequences of sin, reversing the venom and, and the impact of the Nachash through the number 358 and the work of Mashiach through us. So the closer we get to Mashiach, um, that basically means that we are his priesthood, and that is the ultimate uh, level of maturity that we can have to overcome the serpent, which is the furthest away from holding on to the heel of the fleshly man, the Esau one which is fully embodied and embody the, the Nachash in the physical uh, through a human uh, form. Now you can actually say that uh, Esau is like someone that's possessed by the Nachash. And that's basically symbolism of the anti-Mashiach because he's fully possessed by the Nachash, the uh, supplanter, the, the one who's uh, opposing Mashiach and the work of Yahweh. So that wraps that connection up and how a calf, a calf is basically judgment and how the fallen man, Yaakov, his walk is changed and he's translated into Israel, which is another terminology for the priesthood. We're going to see that expressed a bit later on in the end of this teaching. All right, listening, obeying to the words of Yahweh, 
Now, when we read Deuteronomy 7, verse 12 to 15, there's a, fr a phrase there, uh, which is et timaun ekev vahaya, um, which symbolically has got a lot of meaning to it. Now, in the, in the verse it says, then it shall come to pass, because ekev, you listen to with these judgments and God and do them, that Yahweh your Elohim will guard for you the covenant and the mercy which he swore to your fathers. And that, that mercy is basically certain attributes of grace. And he's guarding the covenant for you. So he's protecting the covenant on your behalf. And that's symbolized through um, Abraham that was asleep. The animals were cut in half and the torch of the flaming fire walk in between and cut a covenant with himself. So the consequences of breaking the covenant is that whenever any of the parties break the covenant, the person who walked between the pieces will die because Abraham didn't walk through it, he will live. But the one who walked through it will die. And that's why Mashiach had to die in our place because of that act which he'd done um, in cutting the covenant with Abraham, which is the fundamental basis of the covenant that was translated through Moshe in the form of the two tablets, in the form of the Ten Commandments, in the form of the, the Torah and everything that hangs of it, including all the prophecies that relates to the work of Mashiach in the end times. Um, up to the point of the kiss of Esau and the final judgment, which is the ekev, the final um, separation of your decision where you will end up. So everything is wrapped up into one in this Torah portion, which make it a very, very significant Torah portion. So looking at the phrase et uh, timaun ekev vahaya, in in the first instance you see in the in the Hebrew there you get the aleph taf. Um, which is a symbolism of Mashiach. He is the Aleph Tav. So I got it there at the bottom left, which is the Pali Hebrew Aleph Tav, which is a beautiful picture of um, the Tav on the side, which is symbol symbolic of the cross um, or the impalement of Mashiach, his death. And the Aleph is the strength, it's the resurrection and, and the overcoming of the serpent. And that's basically that first verse that we read that he will bite your heel. That's the symbolism of dying. Um, and then the resurrection is the ox that will resurrect and, and regain strength and overcoming. So that's embodied within the work of Mashiach and also within the letters Aleph Taf. Now the Aleph Taf um, is, in this picture, he is the shepherd and he is walking behind his flock. Now I've put there in little brackets there. Uh, the Timaun uh, Ekev are basically the people. Or the sheep, they are in the middle, and the shepherd is walking behind them, protecting them from the, from the back. It's like saying, "I have you, I've, I've got your back." It's protecting you because the enemy will normally come from the backside. So the Mashiach is covering us from behind. So what is in front of us? We have Vahaya, that means "and it shall be." It's, it will come to pass. It's a result or a consequence of a kev that's embodied within the people. If they make the right decision it shall come to pass but these decisions need to be in line with Yahweh's uh, Torah and based on what the shepherd is promoting because the shepherd is embodied by the letter Lament which is the shepherd's staff it's also the meaningful learning and teaching and we need to learn and the teachings from the Mashiach which is basically the living Torah we should learn from him learn his halakha his halakha is the whole Torah and if we walk in his Torah we will get the consequences and it shall be according to the covenant of the Torah, which will uh, reveal the mercy which he swore to our fathers. That will come to pass. And the mercy which he swore to our fathers also includes the promise, which is entering the promised land um, and restored back to the Garden of Eden and be elevated back to our original state where Adam fell from. So that's the end goal. What we also saw in the 13 attributes of grace is to be one with the Father, and experience his love. That's the garden state that he's going to um, come into being, and it shall be based on that outcome. All right, so, but what's interesting, if you look at the word vahaya, you get hey, yod, hey, uh, vav. And if you shuffle the letters, you can translate it to yote vafai. So it both add up to number 26. So vahaya is Yahweh in disguise. You don't recognize him. But he is the end goal. He is our exceedingly great reward. He's the front. He's the vision. He's the goal where we wanted to add to, uh, aim at. And the shepherd is at the back helping us to get there. 
is leading us to green pastures, which is basically his word, is light nowhere to walk, leading us, showing us the way, showing us the door, and then we enter through that doorway and we you get Vahaya um, or we get Yahweh, which is basically, and it shall be, it shall be in his presence, it shall be so, based on the promises what he swore to your fathers. But it's interesting in number 26, the Gematra says, false lying, to be sad, disheartened, weight, heaviness, grievous, and liver. Liver is, is where all the toxins are, are filtered through the body. And all the toxins are based on all the rubbish that we eat, all the uh, Babylonian food, all the fast foods, all the rubbish, defilement of Yahweh's word, all the different doctrines, all of those things. And also the weight of this world, the heaviness of this world, because we're enslaved by the Nahash building, making bricks for this system that's called Babylon. We're building the city of Babylon that enslave us, just like um, Egypt is, is um, built by the slaves, and every brick they made was another brick to, to hold them back. Uh, to be sad is basically to be in that state of disheartened. You know, you can't fight against these powers. They're too big, big for us, and that's a sadness, disheartened feeling we have if we think about the state that we're currently in. You can't do it by yourself. You need Yahweh's power to, to get you out of this and, and to release you from this. And this is also the falsehood and the lying that caused the liver to be toxified. You, if your liver backs up, you'll end up yellow. So you lose your color and then eventually you die uh, from liver cirrhosis. So, and that's caused by false lying, false food, false uh, teachings and all sorts of things that uh, was introduced through religion and even through uh, people not wanting to become part of um, Yahweh's kingdom because of all the lies and the misrepresentation of what it should be. Um, and that's embodied within the number 26. So the shepherd is leading us out of this. It's a, it's a process of cleansing. And the wilderness is the, the place, which is this life, that take us through this. So we can leave all of that behind. And then we get to the positive side. My holder, my owner, my protector. Protector is the shepherd. Owner is, we now belong to Yahweh. As soon as you go through the, the crossing of the Red Sea, you change masters. You're no longer subject to Pharaoh, the Nachash. You're now subject to Yahweh. And that covenant is then cut at the mountain where you you, you agreed. You signed the contract. Say, I now submit to Yahweh. He's my owner. You no longer belong to yourself. And that's why I say, when you follow Mashiach, you're no longer yourself, and that, uh, owner, owner of yourself. That's what Paul said. Uh, I no longer live, but I live uh, through Mashiach. Um, it's not for yourself anymore. It's a selfless life. And then we get sharp, short, uh, sharp sword, which has to do with the word of Yahweh, um, which help us to um, be pleasing unto him, to gain strength. And then we see window, that's a glimpse of hope. A cube, which links to the city, which is part of the final destination of the promised land. We get the festival of Yahweh, which is another word that has to do with celebration and rejoicing. And also the Moedim, that's part of it. And then we see the praise of Yahweh, where he will be glorified during those times of festivals. And we will be in the presence of Yahweh, which is the Echad, being one with the Father, that is embodied in the number 13, which is also included in this word mercy. And we see in this uh, Deuteronomy 7 is 12 to 15. All of this is because they obey, which is the word Shema. Shema means to hear, to listen, and to obey. So when you hear something, you can hear a noise, but don't take note. When you listen to something, you start off by your uh, give your attention to it, and then you obey, and you, you, you acknowledge that, and then, and then you act on it. So that's what Shema is. It has that three things that interact with you or the three things that need to happen within you in order for Shema to fully come to life within you. So you need to hear, to listen and obey to Yahweh's word in order to be released from this falsehood, the lying, the, the heaviness of this life and the toxins that's in, in, intoxinating um, his body in order to uh, overcome and eventually enter into the promised land. Um, entering into the city and into the presence of Yahweh. So it's all to do with the Shema. You see the Shema is hidden within, um, within the word uh, Tima'un. Um, and then the Ekev is because of the Tima'un, because of you Shema'ing, uh, hearing, listening and obeying, you will enter into the presence of Yahweh, which is uh, all the things associated with the number 26, which is 
basically embodied in the, the letters here, the Vafe. Beautiful, beautiful there. And then we also see, interesting when you look at the phrase, um, and I don't think this is just a coincidence, I think it's by design. There are two ions. Now, two ions means two eyes. It can be always the eyes, it can also be the eyes of the enemy. In a previous study, we looked at the two eyes. The eyes on the Kabbalah one, which is more about mysticism, and the eye on the pyramid, which is more about Freemasonry. And both of those powers are basically influencing the, this kingdom of the Nahash. He worked through those two eyes. And the eye is also the eye with the Egyptian eye, um, which relates to both of them. So we see the eye of the serpent. Um, but then we also know that the eye of Yahweh goes to and fro and look for the righteous, um, which is basically the two sets of eyes that are looking at us. And then we see the two hays. The two hays, of course, are the two tablets. The two tablets that gives life, that gives light, that radiates truth. That's the essence of life and light, uh, which is the word of Yahweh, which is the basis of the Torah and the word of Yahweh. And then we have the two tufts also there. And the two tufts are the two yokes or the two yokes that connect to one another, where you have two oxen. The Mashiach is one ox, you are the other ox. And you have to pull together to break the ground. In order to break the ground is the first step of uh, of getting fruit but you have to sow seed afterwards someone need to water it and then the fruit will come and then there's the harvest the harvest is the basically the great tribulation where the, the multitude of people will come in so we see the symbolism of that also found within the tough but then one tough that you carry is the yoke of the torah because mashiach is the torah so he's already the yoke the ox that carries the torah you need to learn to carry the torah in order to pull with Mashiach to break the ground. We're going to see the symbolism of breaking the ground a bit later on. That's associated with seed and how that works. Very interesting. And all of this is connected to Shema. So um, a beautiful word picture just seeing in that phrase. And a lot of, a lot of knowledge that we see here. And we can see them as three flames that are highlighted. Or the three things, the, the Aleph Tav, which is Yeshua. The fire burning behind us, and then we get uh, uh, Vahaya, which is encapsulating Yahweh in the skies, which is a flame before us. And then you in the middle, you've got the Ekav, Ekev, um, Timaun, which is the Shema. And then because of your listening, you will see the light, but that flame needs to burn within you, that flame of listening and obeying Yahweh's words, Yahweh's Torah. So that's our responsibility within the brackets. He will look after you, will protect you, and you'll be on your way, and you will see his presence and get the promises which he swore to your fathers. Beautiful, beautiful picture there. All right, so going on from that, um, just a bit more on to looking into the words um, and a bit more meaning. So, Vahaya, it shall be, it shall come to pass, and you shall do is another translation of it. So vaya is just not something that you sit passively look at. It's something that you will need to actively do. So when you look at the words in there, you see the vav. That's you. That's your responsibility. You also see the yat, the hand. That's the hand to transform the heel to the yakov, so that you can be pulled away from Esau, from your fleshiness. And that high hand is also the hand of the head, which is Yahweh's hand, which depicts his anointing, which is the transformation of Yaakov into Yisrael, into the kingdom of priesthood. And his anointing, of course, is through the gifts of spirit, um, which we now become the priesthood of Melchizedek, under the authority of Melchizedek, which is the priest of Mashiach. And then we have the two, two uh, Hays, which depicts the commandments. That's the foundation and the basis that we shall do, and then it shall be. Um, and then all of that is basically Yahweh revealed to us as we as we do it shall be and we will see um, the presence of Yahweh in our lives the hand of Yahweh in our lives as you describe some of um, in, in the things that just fall into place you just did the right thing and then Yahweh revealed his character and his supernatural grace within your situation and you no longer sit there and it shall be and woe to us or whatever uh, Yahweh just revealed himself being present in your life uh, through things falling into place um, Tima'un, very interesting here that some Shema is hidden within the Taf and the Vav and the Nun. So we see the little Vav there, that's you. We, we have the Nun, that's fruitfulness. And the Shema will lead to fruitfulness if you, Shema, 
But there's also the tough, as we know, it's the tough of the Torah. So you need to base everything you do on the Torah, listen and obey the Torah, and the fruit will come from you. We look at the, the fruit or the seed, the nun is also seed, how that forms part of this process of restoration and what part you need to play. Now, Kev, of course, means because, it's a result of, it's a consequence of, and it's also wages. So it said you will become least in the kingdom of uh, great in the, uh, in the kingdom. There are wages for the laborers who work in the vineyard. Um, so it's not just everyone's on the same level. Those who've done more will receive a greater reward than those who didn't do much. But you'll at least you'll just get in and be saved. Um, but at the end, it's all about um, receiving the wages. In this life, trying the best we can with what we have within our broken state, uh, aspiring to become better and better and become part of the priesthood of Yahweh so we can be uh, useful within the kingdom and work in his vineyard. All right, Temun um, is a word that is written in future tense. So that implies that the Shema is a future Shema. And that means that this listening and obeying and hearing is for the future generation. It's not only for the people who's been, who heard this, and that's basically part of the previous Torah portion that we discussed. It's eternal. Yahweh's commands are eternal. It's for the future generation as well. It's the act of Shema that resonates throughout eternity. And it will always be there. So you can never, ever, ever, ever abolish Yahweh's Torah. You could choose to disobey it, but there will be a kef, there will be consequences. But you don't have the power to change anything or alter anything about Yahweh's Torah. Because these tablets are renewed and it's in the hand of the Mashiach. It will never be broken. He will keep it intact. And even if you try to abolish it, it's just your rebellious way of disobeying it. But then you will bear the consequences uh, for your stupidity and foolishness. So this phrase here, uh, I call the covenant formula, because within this formula of these letters, we see everything encapsulated within it. And the heart of this formula is the Shema. That's our active, um, that's our responsibility, or that's our key, our means to unlock the keys of this covenant so that mercy will flow to us, so that protection will flow to us. So that Yahweh Elohim's presence will flow to us. And it's activated through the Shema, through hearing, through listening actively and obeying. And hearing and listening and obeying his Torah, not doctrines. So that's the, the key to unlock the covenant in your life. All right, the next, where am I? Um, the next one is... To move from the wilderness to the garden and the key is the heart so that's something interesting found in deuteronomy 8 verse 2 where it says and you shall remember all the way uh, of yahweh your elohim let you these 40 years in the wilderness to humble you to prove you to know what was in your heart whether you will keep his commandments or not so the heart is sort of the key, and this key is found within the word ekev, which is the kuf. The kuf, um, when you look at the letter kuf, it means turning the head. It's symbolism for repentance, or changing your mind. But it's also a term for making decisions, because repentance is basically making another decision or making another choice, and that will lead to other consequences. But it's also associated with a doorway, a gate, an opening. And we saw that with the letter Lamet Kuf, which is basically Jacob's ladder. It's the bottom letter that reached down to the lowest part of the physical, just like the heel is the lowest part of man, which is the lowest part of the physical form of man. The Kuf reached down to that level of humanity in order to pull him out with the Yod of Yahweh, so that they can access the Lamet, which is the shepherd, the teaching of the Torah, that will take them up the ladder into Yahweh's presence. That's the Kuf Lamet principle. And the Kuf is the doorway, the gate that open up to the rest of the ladder, which is Mashiach, the learnings and the teachings of his Torah, 
that will open up the doorway that leads to the garden and the, the presence of Yahweh. So you see that the, the bottom gate is the Kuf represented by um, the center letter of Ikev. Um, so this doorway is directly linked to your heart. Now, the listening and obeying part of it and your actions of decision making, why the connection to the heart? If you think about, I make decisions, it's basically the frontal part of your, your, your brain. That's where decision making is. And so I make all my decisions in the mind. But if you think about it, whenever you're in a very severe state, in a severe emotional state, that part of your brain switch off. You go to your little reptile brain, fight or flight, and the emotions of the heart will overwrite the mind. And you will do what's in your heart. And what's in your heart is your ultimate lowest or, or raw form of your nature. And you will express that, good or bad. So the heart is actually the, the, where the place is where the seed of your nature lies that will influence your thoughts and your thoughts will then uh, result in actions and words and that's how the the whole thing works it starts off with the heart and when we get the Shema the Shema is about hearing listening and obeying it's about um, getting things into the ear we also know that the spirit writes the commandments on the heart and what's interesting about the heart and the ear it's linked to the term of circumcision. Now, circumcision means to cut off a blockage. It doesn't mean to cut off a foreskin. Because what is circumcised in Scripture, yes, it's the foreskin, which is physical, but it's a circumcision of the heart. It's a circumcision of the ear. It's a circumcision of the mouth. And also the circumcision of the trees that need to wait for the blockage to be removed so that you can harvest the fruit to leave it for a certain time, period of time before you harvest to remove that blockage and time is the factor there. So circumcision and all of them are connected to seed. The, the male genital, the genital is seed, um, hearing words, that's the words of, of uh, the seed of the word. What's going into the heart is the seed of the word that's planted in the heart, which is compared to the ground. If you look, uh, read the parable of Yeshua that gave us a uh, parable of the sower, um, and then when you speak, you speak words or seeds that will go through the ears of other people that will fall into the hearts. And if the heart, if the ground is prepared, that will bear fruit. And within the fruit, they seed. And that fruit will be resulting into actions and words that will multiply the original seed. So what we see is the mechanism of seed, that letter noon that we talked about. That's in the word, uh, what's the word again? Let me just go there. Okay, Tim, uh, that little noon there, that's the seed we're talking about. It's connected to the Shema. It's all connected to the Torah, and it's your fruit, your seed. First you receive it from the Torah, then it goes into your heart. If, the, if your heart is circumcised, the soil will be fertile, and that word of Yahweh will grow in your heart. Then it will come through your mouth, because now you blockage of your mouth is being open up and you will speak his word it will go through the ears of man if they prepare to hear and to listen to the shema it will go into their ears fall in their hearts and if their heart is circumcised and they can repent truly repent that seed will grow into their heart and then the torah is written on their heart and then they will be able to speak if the circumcision of the of the mouth happened and then they will uh, bear fruit which contain the seed of yahweh's word so that's the process of translating the original seed and it started with creation Yahweh spoke everything into existence through words which were the seeds of creation the DNA of his creation was spoken the words are the medium or the, or the seeds and now we have the ability to speak as well and that's what we discussed last week as well the sword of the word the flaming sword from the mountain is so powerful it ex it, it, it transcends the person who's speaking. It's as if Yahweh is speaking, if you speak his word. That's how powerful the, the seed of the word is. Now, if you understand that, and it comes from the heart, which is uncircumcised, and it's from an uncircumcised mouth, and you speak the sword of the word, the seed of the word, it is so powerful. And we need to understand that. It is all to do with the letter kuf connecting to the heart. And the heart's um, 
that's been tested here is for Yahweh to see your level of maturity. The priesthood will obey and do his commandments. Some commandments seem ridiculous. Oh, why do we do that? It's all about being part of the priesthood. The priesthood follow a recipe. The recipe has the spiritual ingredients to facilitate a thing in the physical that's got a spiritual impact for the benefit of the physical. So it's not about you. It's about following the recipe that connects the spiritual to the physical to restore back. And that's what the priesthood does. So when you obey his commandments, it's like baking a cake. You didn't invent the recipe. You just follow it. So if you follow the commandments, you're basically executing the recipe for restoration in this world by doing it. So your actions is then seen by people. Your words are heard by people. And for you, executing a recipe through your life, manifesting it through actions and words, will have an impact and will have fruit. And when people take off that fruit, they will see the fruits of your life, they will analyze it, then there's a chance of that seed that's within your actions and words to fall in their hearts and they will be transformed. And then your work is done and people will come into the kingdom. So you see the whole process there coming into play, the little cycle of the seed of Yahweh being transferred. And it's all about the creation of man. So Yahweh spoke initially to create man, but man is the most complex being that will take 6,000 years to create humanity into the full image of Yahweh. So it started off with um, Adam. Then the more prominent person after that was Enoch. After that was Noah. After that was Abraham. After that was Moshe. And then we got King David. And then we got Mashiach. And then there's Paul and all the other saints and all the other prophets after that. So everyone had a part to play to transfer the seed, and that seed is basically also encapsulated with the concept of the birthright, to carry the seed of the birthright, the seed of the priesthood, and transform that and guard it and keep it so that that can have its power. If you think about seed, you can't destroy seed. Seed can be dormant. It can be in a drawer at the bottom of your cupboard. But as soon as you take that seed, you put it in the ground that's fertile, you add water, it will grow and bear fruit. It can lie there for years and years and years. In the same way, the, the Torah, the books with the letters in it, that seed, that's dormant seed. So if you bring it up, you read it, you certainly search it, and you start to activate it in your life, giving it life, adding water to it, your energy, and start speaking it, it will bear fruit in your life. And it's bringing that fruit of the seed from the dead pages into uh, life. And it will change your life and change help change Yahweh's creation, help restore Yahweh's creation through facilitating the recipe of his instructions, um, creating the things that facilitate the restoration process in your life. All right, so that's a lot. Um, I hope I made my point there. There's some other analogy I want to just throw in here about listening and obeying. If you think about the heart, is enough for technical people as the storage device because the tablets are stone and the code is written within the stone so it can't change it's like writing software on the hard drive it's there and when you execute it through the processor which is the mind so the heart contains the storage device with the program on it the mind is the processor to execute the, the the information and then it performs an action which is your words and your actions and the software runs well but when there's a virus coming in, it will corrupt the hearts of man, it will corrupt the software. The processor will still take the data and execute it, but the outcome will be slightly different based on what type of virus it is. It might go in the loop, it might do spamming, it might do whatever, it might do harm, it might shut everything down, whatever the, the virus is written for, that will execute it. Now the venom of the serpent that will bite you in the heel, is the doorway that's opened by your heel, the lowest part of your fleshiness, will open up for the venom to come in to corrupt your heart or the data and your processor, your little mind, will execute the data that's your heart that's now full of little virus lies and deception and confusion or whatever. And then your actions and your words will be corrupted just as, as, as per the venom or as per the virus. In order to get rid of the virus, you do a hard reboot and I have to reboot the whole operating system. That's the coof, that's the repentance, turning the head, uh, total uh, renewing, uh, born again process. That's a reboot process. 
and then you can function again and running from the original data and the original data is the Torah. You have to go back to the Torah. You cannot run the program based on all the new modern day doctrines in the New Testament or uh, New Testament churches and all the things that they uh, came up with to try and make sense of it. You have to go back to the original program, which is the Torah, in order to have a proper reboot and get rid of all the viruses, all the false doctrines and all the false teachings. You have to reboot it with the Torah. So that's all I want to say about that. Uh, I hope it makes sense. This is a flow on from that analogy, but it's now linked to Matthew 20, verse 1 to 8, where Yeshua said, For the kingdom of heaven is like a landowner who went at early in the morning to hire laborers for his vineyard. So when evening had come, the owner of the vineyard said uh, to his steward, Call the laborers and give them their wages, which is ekev, um, beginning with the last to the first. Who will, will be first, will be last, who will be last, will be first. That's the principle as well. So it's not a respecter of person. Yahweh will give you a reward that is based on what you've done, and you will get ekev, your wages, because of what you've done. And we all work in his vineyard. So vineyard is the word kerem. It is kaf resh mem. No, kaf means hand. Resh means mind or head. Can also means head or leader. And mem, of course, is the word. It can also means water. So when you dig into the ground or you plow the ground, that's the hand. It's also the hand that sow the seed. And then the mind is the one that does the action. I know the process of you know, tilling the ground, the process of sowing the seed, the process of uh, giving water. So that's basically um, what is within the Torah on how to do it. That's the recipe, the instructions on how to work in the garden. And when you do that, the water of the word will basically give it life and then it will be fruit. So those are the little building blocks for working in a vineyard. And this vineyard, if you think about it, is like a um, oasis in the desert where you have the chance to create something where people can come to and nourish, get nourishment as they travel through the wilderness. And the wilderness is not designed for the flesh. It's not a place where you can go on a holiday because it's very harsh conditions. You need uh, uh, to take food with or you need supernatural help in order to survive the wilderness. And yet Yahweh led them through 40 years through the wilderness. And this is the little oasis that we can help to create alongside the way to help people to make it at towards the end. And this is where we our efforts come into play. Why it's important to work in this vineyard, work in this garden. It's for the benefit of others in order to restore, refresh, and to strengthen them so that they can keep on going. Okay, Ram. It's got the march of 260. That means stubborn, worthless, resentful, young men's village, rebellious, idolatrous, priest, weakness, son of the black and become black to sell, gathered by the people, let the people rise, slander. And then we have Yahweh jumping in, axe cutting off to break, to cry for help. That's the... Uh, the owner of the vineyard, my father takes care of the vineyard, as we read in John 15, and he prunes and he cuts. And it's a lot of crying and carrying on if that happens, the pruning. We don't like pruning. We like the fruit. We like, like the blessings. But I don't like pruning. I don't like to, to go through that. But you have to go through that to get rid of your stubbornness, your resentfulness, your rebellion, and your weakness. The father needs to come and cut off those branches doesn't bear fruit and if we go through that process this is what the wilderness is about and this is what the oasis within the wilderness is all about is to create tillable ground to tend the vineyards to uncover hidden treasures to unearth the value and to become hot to become passionate to have a zeal a lamp a light in the darkness and ultimately a priest so that's the whole function of what the priesthood is for. The priesthood is great little oasis so that they 
can earth the hidden treasure. Now I've got the hidden treasures there. That's basically what we do every week. We derosh the rice, we search the scriptures, we bring the gems out, the hidden treasures. And that is basically the recipes of the instruction to facilitate, to create the things of what help restore Yahweh's creation. And also to help to, to bear fruit and also to create the nourishment that people need on their travels through this very hot and dry, uh, terrifying wilderness called this life. Now, tilling the ground of the vineyard um, has a process. You first need to break the ground to sow the seed in order to um, get that uh, fruit. And that's about changing your nature, breaking the ground of the heart. And that's where the axing and the cutting off comes in. It's about breaking the ground, breaking that old habit. Uh, getting you out of that Yaakov, that heel, that lowest level of yourself to elevate the man into a higher spiritual man. And the second part of it um, has to do with the uncovering and unearthing the gems. So after you've been released from the fleshiness, now your focus is on the spiritual, not the physical. And now you spend time learning and teaching Yahweh's word, uh, which is the cycle of the seed, which I explained previously. And that's what we need to do to keep ourselves busy with, not with fleshy things, but with spiritual things for the benefit of people in order to be oasis and to help them to have fruit on the travels through this wilderness, to provide shade, comfort, rest, peace, and something to eat. That's our jobs as the priesthood. All right, this is a play on uh, the word for wilderness that's found in Deuteronomy 14, verse 15. When your heart be lifted up and you forget the Yahweh, your Elohim, who brought you out of the land of Egypt from the house of bondage, who led you through the great and awesome, which is translated as terrible, wilderness, wherein the fiery serpents, the scorpions, and drought, where there was no water, who brought thee forth uh, water out of a rock of flint. So that is basically Yahweh telling us, and remind us not to forget that he brought us out of the house of bondage and not to forget that he helped us through this great and awesome terrifying wilderness where there are dangers like the serpent like the scorpion and drought where there's nothing to drink we looked after us giving us uh, water from the rock of flint now this is a, a, a beautiful word picture when you look at the Hebrew word for great, awesome wilderness, I'm going to use the word awesome instead of terrifying. Because terrible or awesome is basically, it induces fear and awe. It's not fear as in running, it's fear as in your, your mouth dropped to the ground. You can't believe what you see, that kind of awe, awesomeness. Um, now, when you look at the, the Hebrew letters of, of that, it's the phrase gadol, Vahanura. I hope I said it right. Um, so Gadol is great and Vahanura is awesome. Now, what we see in there is the letters. We have an Aleph and we have two Vavs. And we look at that, it's a number one plus six plus six, that's the Aleph plus the Vav plus the Vav, which add up to number 13. So we see in the awesomeness of this wilderness, we see the attributes of Yahweh, the attributes of grace, in, uh, hidden within the wilderness. So Yahweh, Yahweh's grace is hidden within your worst situation in your life. So if someone goes through a very bad situation, the 13 attributes of grace are in there. Because you're facing a scorpion, you're facing a serpent, you're facing a famine or there's no water. You go through a very tough time. But in spite of it, there's the olive and there's two vavs, there's 13, there's the attributes of grace. Yahweh's presence, his attributes are there in the midst of all of that. He will not go away. Um, the two vavs represent the two men or the two stages of man, the immature man, which is embodied by Yaakov, and the mature man, which is, which is represented by Yisrael or the priesthood. And then the, the Aleph, which is the Yahweh, 
Remember, Yaakov uh, struggled with the angel, fought with the angel, which was actually Yahweh. And that is encountering Yahweh that changed his halakha, his walk. So just like the venom of the serpent changed the walk, now the hip was touched. So Yahweh didn't bite him on the, on the heel. Yahweh touched his hip, which is higher up. And where's the hip? It's in relation to um, the genitals, which is to do with fleshiness, but it's high up. And it's got an uh, elevation of uh, the fleshiness, basically. Um, and the reproduction of the fruit and the seed, the emphasizing of the seed and the generations, the new generations. And that changed the walk so your generation can be changed as well. Um, so we see the two uh, stages of man. And uh, the wilderness represents the physical. And this transformation has to do with changing the mind, which is the little resh that we find in there as well. Uh, which is also related to the turning of the head, which is the uh, act of repentance. And then we see the letter nun, little green letter there, which is the fruit we just talked about. And this fruit is because of encountering the light. We get the letter hey there, that's the light. The light, remember, the two A's, it's the Torah. We've got the light there with the letter hey which is connected to the Lamet. The Lamet is connected to the shepherd and the teacher, which teach us Yahweh's truth, which relates to the tablet, the hang, the light, the truth of Yahweh's word. And that truth will lead you to the door. We get the Dalet there. And then through all of this, you have the help of the Gimel. The Gimel is the camel that carry you through the wilderness. And the Gimel is one of the letters that represent the spirit of Yahweh. We have the Hay, which is the spirit of truth, the light. And then we have the Shin, which is the fire that also relates to fire, light, uh, uh, holiness. And then we have the Gimel, which is carrying you, the spirit, the helper, the hand that carries us. And this is what we see in the word Gadol uh, Vahura, the awesome, great wilderness. Um, we see all of this embodied within that. So this place is where the old man, the unbelieving generation, will be changed to a new man. The next generation, um, that can enter into the promised land. Now that's the stage of this Torah portion, where Moses is addressing this new generation, reminding them not to forget Yahweh or Elohim, because if you do, there will be a kev, there will be consequences. Just like your fathers travel for 40 years in a loop. You're on a loop for 40 years. That will represent your little loop of fallen state. You need to get out of that loop and be elevated above it so you can enter in. And that's the bigger picture of the cycle. We're currently in a fallen state of death because Adam died. You're not dead, dead. You're walking dead. So in a lower state of uh, existence, which is like a state of death or fleshiness. We need to elevate it to real life, which is the picture of Adam in the garden. And that's where we need to break this loop of 40 years, the uh, loop of 40. And number 40, or number 4 means the work of Mashiach. It's also the number of the letter Dalet. That's the doorway out of this loop, is Mashiach, in order to be elevated. And the process of elevation is the process of becoming priesthood, the process of being transformed from a Yaakov into a Yisrael, the process of being changed from a fleshly person into a priest. Beautiful picture there of the new man and the old man. Now, what's interesting here is Deuteronomy 10 verse 17 describe Yahweh in the same way he described this wilderness. It says, For Yahweh your Elohim is the Elohai Elohim, the God of gods, and the Adun, uh, Adunai Etuni, which is the Lord of lords, and the great Elohim and a, a mighty and awesome which uh, regards no person and nor takes any reward which is a cave again so we see here that yahweh is great mighty and awesome where the wilderness is only great and awesome the difference between yahweh and the wilderness is he is mighty so he is elevated above this wilderness some people worship this life as their god and they put the I, me, as the king, 
of my little dunghill, my little castle, and I'm ruling within this, and I'm worshiping this life, my existence. I worship myself. But Yahweh is the great I am, the real king, which you need to submit to. And in order to do that, or if you do that, the consequences will be you won't be sucked into the elements of this wilderness, which is the fiery serpents and the scorpions and the famine and all the sadness things we looked at previously. You'll be elevated from it. So your experience will change as soon as you put him on the throne and you climb off the throne yourself. You need to dethrone yourself and put Yahweh on the throne in order to change your experience within this life. So you can experience the blessings, not the curses. It's all to do with the goof turning there, making the right decisions. So uh, great, mighty, and awesome is the word Kadol Gibor Vaora, Va, sorry, Va Hanora. And um, uh, Gibor is Gimel Bet Vafresh that is associated with Yahweh's strength and his power to overcome the challenges of this wilderness which are the five serpents and the scorpions and the drought. Now the scurp, uh, serpents represents the Nachash and the enemy and all his henchmen. Scorpions has to do with fleshiness and temptations, flesh temptations. Drought means there's no spiritual truth and no water means there's no Torah. There's no uh, source of the truth. Now when we look at these separately, serpent is with Nachash. That can be translated as enchanter. It means that it's someone that's cunning and skilled that can change your mind and influence your decision making or your kuf. And this can cause you to be confused and enter into the wrong gate because that's a place of decision. And you need the right key to open the right gate. And because we're in the world of duality, there's always two choices, right or wrong, black, white, hot, cold. There's always choices to make. And choose life, no, choose death. Choose righteousness, not unrighteousness. And we need our moral compass to be aligned uh, as well. Otherwise, we end up entering through the wrong gate, making the wrong decisions that will ekev or result in that uh, death or being trapped in a state of death uh, and not being elevated. So that is the serpent. Now, the scorpion is the word uh, akarav. Uh, that's similar to the word Ikev, it's just got a resh inserted. And the resh uh, is in, a neg in its negative form, it means human reasoning or fleshly thinking. In a positive form, it means leader. So a scorpion can be a leader <clears throat> of the house, which is the bed. But it's also, because it's on the left, it's no human reasoning and fleshly thinking within the house, um, which leads to the wrong decision making, which is the goof, that leads to the eye. The eye is the original sin. She saw that the fruit looked good, and she partook of that fruit, and it had a consequence, a whole new direction entering through the wrong gate. So that is uh, symbolized through this word scorpion. And this scorpion is basically uh, embodied in the symbolism of Yaakov or Jacob, the circumventor. The one who's conniving, if you look at the serpent, he's a scorpion, he's on the ground, you don't see him. He's like a serpent. He can sting you on the feet and change your halakha and your walk. It's also a poisonous uh, creature. So it's not a, a pleasant experience. But if you take Yaakov and you turn him around, you get an Yisrael. That turning around is doing a 180, walking the other way, walking away from Esau, walking away from the man of the field, walking towards Yisrael, the righteous people of Elohim, becoming the priesthood. That is what repentance is about, the changing of the name from Yaakov into Esau. And this is now the changing of the scorpion. So what do we do if we do a 180 on the scorpion? If you read the word Akarav, which is scorpion from left to right, you get the word uh, Baraka, that means blessing. I forgot to put it in there. Um, so this scorpion that is venomous, that can sting you on the feet just like a serpent. It's like being a, a priesthood of the Nahash is the scorpion, basically. In order to change it around to become a blessing, that scorpion, which is a Yaakov, needs to be translated into a priesthood, which is Israel. And that's where you now become 
on the sub subject to the Mashiach, where he used to be subject to the Nachash. You had the nature of the serpent, you bite the heel, scorpion stings the heel. And we also see the symbolism of the scorpions in the last days. Same symbolism. So there's a lot of fleshiness and a lot of things happening in there. It's associated with the house as well. As I mentioned, the leaders in the house are the scorpions. So the evil cabal are like scorpions with a venom. And they do the work or they're the priesthood of the Nachash. And they perform all the judgments that come upon man. That symbolism is, is the same and it's in the wilderness. Um, but we can turn them around to become blessings if they repent. And that's where the, the cycle of the seed, we need to have the seed in the hearts. We need to speak the seed through our words. We need to help people to circumcise their ears and the hearts so they can bear fruit and be transformed and repent so they, they Yaakov can change into Israel and they can become part of the righteous people of Elohim. Um, so that's a beautiful picture how to change something that is evil into something that's good. So the scorpion is the power of changing the old nature into a new nature and, and something evil into a blessing where the serpent is an ahash that we need to be taken care of by someone else. And that someone else is basically the Mashiach. And we see that little hint there through the number 358 because Nahash and Mashiach share the same Gematra, which is 358. So the one is the solution to the problem. So Mashiach is going to crush the head of the Nahash. He's going to overpower him, take his kingdom, and set up the new kingdom, which is depicted by the new Jerusalem, the promised land, the city, and all of that with that will come. So that is through the Gematra. And we see there. So the, the uh, you're your own enemy. You're the you're the you're the scorpion. You need to overcome yourself through repentance, doing a 180. Changing from being a priest of the Nachash, in, I mean, in, in becoming a priest of Mashiach, which is becoming part of the household of Israel. And then Mashiach will take care of the Nachash. It's not your problem. You, you are your own problem. You need to take, take care of yourself through repentance. Repenting every day, every fleshy thing that you do, that you know of, repent, repent, repent. That's how you get the scorpion and the old nature out of you and, and elevating the priest within you. Um, What's also there is the hint. We see that the water came from the rock. We know the symbolism of the rock in the wilderness is the symbolism of Mashiach. Water coming from a rock is a supernatural thing. The rock is also the symbolism of the foundation of building the house, building the temple. Everything is built upon Mashiach, which is the Torah. It's a living Torah. Everything is built upon the Torah. And the water that comes from the Torah is the living water, which is the spiritual concept of the Torah. That's now taken from dead letters, given life, and now it's expressed through the circumcision of the heart, the mouth, and speaking that word. That's the living waters that come from the innermost parts uh, through the help of the gimel, the camel, the spirit of Yahweh within you. Um, but what we see here is um, the hint, the flint. It's a rock of flint. So the rock has two functions. It produced water, but it also produced the spark, which is the source for fire. Now, you need both of them to survive the wilderness. You need water to survive, but the fire is in order to survive the cold nights. It's in order to cook food. It's to bring warmth. And most importantly, it's to provide light in the darkness, because the wilderness also depicts darkness, a place of darkness. This fleshy world is so dark, we don't know where we're going. In order to see the light, is in order to see the direction, the way to go, in order to see the doorway, the gates, to go through it, to enter in. So light is crucial in order to find a way through this dark wilderness to escape this cycle of 40 that is trapped in this lower state in order to escape that through the dalet, the doorway, and the gate, the goof, through the decision-making to enter into this promised land, into the presence of Yahweh, as we've seen here. So all of that is within this rock, providing water, which is a life force, it's also the, the symbolism of the word of Yahweh. It came from him. The Torah is flowing from him. He's the essence and the origin of the Torah. But it's also the origin of the fire. The way we discussed the, the tabernacle, fire is also the word for foundation. Yahweh is a consuming fire. He's the spark. And the, the real essence and the purpose of fire 
is 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 light but it's also energy and the energy as we discussed previously is the embodiment of the gifts within us it's the energy that flow from the chaya down so you receive it through the upper room experience the spirit and then you can transfer that energy which is the anointing upon other people you know i have the little yacht they can put on the head of people to make them uh, from a heel to a yakov to pull them out of the, the, the confines of Esau, pull them away from the power of the Nachash and translate them into uh, Yisrael coming into the household. It's done through the anointing, through the energy of the fire, which is a consuming fire, the spirit of Yahweh living within you. Um, beautiful picture there. But what we see here is the hint of the flint. The flint is the word. Let me just find it. Where is it? Chalamis. Chalamis. Chet Lamet Mem Yod Shin. If we shuffle the words and the letters of Chalamis, which is flint, yeah, uh, you can make the word Lamashiach, which is unto Mashiach, of for Mashiach. Is the word Mashiach with the Lamet in front of it? We know the Lamet is the shepherd, it's also the teacher, it's learning. It's for Mashiach, so we sit under his teaching and we do everything for Mashiach, that's La Mashiach, and that's what's the word for flint. So we see that the rock that will crash the head of the serpent is this flint, the same rock that produced the water, the same rock that produced the fire, it's the same rock that will hit the statue, the feet, destroying the kingdom. That rock is Mashiach, unto Mashiach, the shepherd, the Lamet, the one that is leading us in the way. Uh, during this dark wilderness, providing light and nourishment, the life source, uh, make us enter back into the Garden of Eden. And that is all, folks. That's what I've got for you today. Any questions or comments? Yeah, thank you, Phil. We don't have any questions, but there's, it's full of really good analogies. The analogies are endlessly linked, aren't they? Yeah, it's like a, 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 a weave tapestry. Everything yeah. connects to everything. It harmonizes with fundamental truths. It just reestablishes the truth over and over and over again. But what's emphasized here is what is your job? And the key is guard your heart. The other key is listen and obey. What you need to listen to by the origin, the Torah, not doctrine. Yeah. Mm. Yeah. Yes, like like you say, we are our own worst enemy. We shouldn't be looking out for, uh, oh, <clears throat> you know, the devil made me do that, or I'm fighting. No, it's ninety nine percent of the time you're fighting against your own in, inner self. Yeah, it's the scorpion within. That's causing That's all right. the issues, and then you rebuke the Nakash, but he wasn't even present. He's just laughing at you because he's one of his little henchmen. You don't realize, yeah. yeah. Yep. Yep. That's part of being deceived. Uh, you don't know that. You don't know. But if no, that's you, right. you where to fix it, you need to fix yourself through the Torah. That's the way to get release from the claws of the Nakash because you're entrapped in the embodied in the in the. Uh, symbolism of the, uh, the scorpion. Uh, you, know, you need to become a blessing through repentance. Yeah. Yeah. A lot of things. It's just very personal Torah portion for myself as well. Um, and it's a. Well, I think it's now my favorite Torah portion. <laughs> oh, we yeah. we love Deuteronomy. Yeah. Oh, I think it's the. Besides Genesis, I think Deuteronomy is my favorite. Yeah, no, it's really, really good. And that's a book that Yeshua quoted the most from. The most, okay, all yeah, of the New Testament sense. is basically Deuteronomy coming from the mouth of Mashiach. Yep. Yep. Yeah. It's, it's, uh, it's so cut and dried, I think, and it's, it's, <laughs> there's very little ambiguity throughout Deuteronomy and you know, I guess we, uh, we all like things that are black and white, and it's pretty black and white. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Mm. Yes. 
Yeah. Thank you very much. No worries, mate. Hope you have a good day. All right. Thank you. All right. Shabbat shalom. Shabbat shalom.